The ranching life is a hard one, but especially when it causes gender confusion. In author Tamara Lindsay's world, growing up on a cattle ranch and farm in northern Wyoming, worth was measured by the work you got done. Moving cows, fixing fences, driving tractors, in short, man's work. And so, Lindsay learned to conform to masculine ideals, keeping secret her short story writing and journaling. It wasn't until college and later that she embraced womanhood and writing. Tamara Lindsay recently published a book on short stories titled How to Be a Man. She joined our Leslie Wagoner earlier to share some of her colorful experiences. I want to ask you how you would describe the short stories in How to Be a Man. Well, they're about men and women in Wyoming who are having a hard time. I mean, they're, they're in rough spots um, and they're trying to find ways. They tend to be very lonely and they're trying to find ways to connect and to, to have self-respect. Um, and they do it in a number of different ways. Let's go ahead and, and from the short story, How to Be a Man, the signature story, let's read a, read a quote from that story. Okay. Um, how to Be a Man. Never acknowledge the fact that you're a girl and take pride when your guy friends say, you're one of the guys. Tell yourself, I am one of the guys, even though in the back of your mind, a little voice says, but you've got girl parts. So why in that story, it's a, it's a story of a young girl. Well, you tell me the, the story. Sorry. And why does she want to be a man? Well, I think that there is, um, there are women in the West who they're, they, they, they're growing up and they look around them and they see that the only way that they can have respect is to be a man. The only people they see that have respect are men. And so they think, well, I guess I have to be a man. Um, and so they do everything they can. And I think we all know women like this who, you know, they may hunt, they may, they own pickup trucks, they drink beer, they watch football, um, all their friends are men. Um, they're the first ones to tell, you know, dumb blonde jokes or, you know, jokes about women. They have no women friends because for heaven's sake. Um, and they think of themselves as this weird third gender. Um, they can't be men and so, um, they can't be men, and they certainly are not women because they wouldn't want to think of themselves as women, and so they think of themselves as this third gender that's almost genderless. Is that a comfortable way? To not be? at all, not at all. I mean, um, anytime you deny something you essentially are, whether you know, you're know you African American and you're passing as white, or you're gay and you're passing as heterosexual, or whatever, anytime you deny something that you essentially are, you spend all your energy and all your time working against yourself. Um, and it's uh, really self-destructive. Ah. Well, is this a bit autobiographical then? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I certainly was one of those women, um, one of those girls where, um, you know, I, I, there are lots of really good qualities about that too. I mean, you want to be strong, you want to be capable, you want to be pragmatic, which are very Wyoming qualities. And, and that is wonderful, but when it, when it goes beyond that and it becomes this thing where um, uh, you hate yourself, hmm. then that, then it's very destructive. And that, and, and why do you hate yourself? Well, that? because you, you're, you aren't accepting who you are. Um, you How know, did it, you finally accept who you are? Um, it was coming to the university and taking a, a women's studies class. And that class, oh, it was a wonderful class and a horrible class. Oh, and, uh, what made you think, huh? Because, yeah, because every day, I mean, you'd go in and you'd learn so much. I would challenge those assumptions that I'd had as a child, mm -hmm. and and um, it was wonderful, but it was also horrible because I was, I had to shed so many, you know, deeply held beliefs. Oh. How did your family react when you became a girl? <laughs> when I became a girl, um, you know, it, it's it's uh, we've had conversations over the years, um, and uh, we are a family of black sheep, so so it was just another. A family of black sheep. A family sheep. of black sheep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it was just another thing. I think they were fairly accepting. A family of black sheep. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a short characterization of why a family of black sheep? A short. Why my family is a family of black, black sheep. sheep? Um, we were, I was born and raised on a ranch, of course, and out in the country, you don't have, um, you know, society 
telling you to be a certain way. So when you live in town, everybody's like, mm. we, we, we were a member of this group and we do these things. But when you're out on the ranch, you make your own rules. And sometimes these rules, especially when you, your ideals are John Wayne and the, the, the cowboy way and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, there's wonderful qualities about that, like, you know, strength again and, and pragmatism, but there's also might makes right. Oh. And so what's most important is, you know, making sure the ranch survives and the individual um, does not matter. So what does it mean to sacrifice self for the ranch? Ranches don't have much profit margin. It's really, really hard to make a go when you're ranching. Um, and when you get too many people on a small ranch, families go into business together, um, in order to make the ranch go, you have to sacrifice a lot. You have to, you know, the rest of the world is buying whatever, you know, toys or whatever, and you can't because you just don't have any money. And then you have, on top of that, you have everybody's feelings um, um, all mixed together and, and bad feelings build up. Um, we had a whole Hatfields and McCoys thing in the 80s and the 90s, um, you know, um, people shooting at each other, nobody was killed. Um, wow. And a family, lawsuits, a, yeah, a family wow. feud. Okay. Um, lawsuits, dogs were shot. Um, things like that and and um, it was just it's just because you know families going into business together mm. not enough resources it inevitably leads to conflict I think what is it about the West and especially this area of the Rocky Mountain West that resonates with you that makes you want to center your stories in this area well of course I grew up here I mean I, I, um, they say that every writer has just a couple of themes that they just they, that's what they write about. And for me, this is what I write about. Um, I don't think it's a choice, actually. It's what, if you're really going for the material that, that is going to be your best material, and it's not as calculating as that. It's, okay. it's simply um, writing what makes you uncomfortable, what mm. embarrasses you, what, what um, that will be your best work. And that's, I, I had a, um, an instructor once, a mentor named Steve Almond, who um, told me, run screaming toward the fear, and that's, that'll be your best work. So, ah, Okay, getting under that fear. Well, some of these stories, like um, Oranges and Hard Men, I felt like I was reading like the gritty underlying headline of a family tragedy. Um, are any of these stories based on re reality, based mm -hmm. on news stories? Well, they're they're all based on reality and any author that tells you they don't write from experience is lying because of course the only thing you can write is what you know um, but it's probably not the way you think I mean often there are specific events that it's based on um, but it's also much more about getting to the tr emotional truth of the situation and so you'll alter details um, to m better match the story and so Yes, definitely autobiographical in certain points, but they might, it might not be the details that you think are autobiographical. Well, who are the authors who have influenced you to write these types of stories? Um, you know, uh, my author greats, the ones that I love, are Hemingway and Virginia Woolf. Okay. Um, and Hemingway is obvious. He's a, a, he influences us all sort of with, with his mystique. Um, and I definitely inherited, inherited his voice, the very clipped short sentences, mm. the pullback of emotion. Um, but then Virginia Woolf writes what I try to write, which is um, in t you know, what happens in families, what happens between people, okay. the small violences we do to each other, the small kindnesses we do to each other. You know? we, um, um, I try to, try to portray lived reality, lived experience. Um, you know, there are books that try to try to give you an adventure, and, and they're perfectly valid. That's a great way to, you know, that's a great thing to do with a book. But for me, I'm trying to show what, it's, what it feels like to be in a room with two people and, and the way that they interact and how they feel. And um, so that's what, and that's why Virginia Woolf. That's what she and did. that really does come out in these stories. Well, thank you, Tamara, for taking this time to be with us. Thank you so much. It's yeah. been great. Thank you. <laughs>